Anand, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's such a um, pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, well, we've got a great topic lined up here. We're going to be talking about compensation. And I know you and Fidelity have done a lot of work in this area over the years. It's a area that comes up frequently in conversations that I'm having when I'm working with advisors. And so I thought, well, let's do a show on compensation. So where I'd like to start is this idea of having a compensation philosophy. And what I mean by that is, as I've worked with advisors over the years, it seems like there's a couple schools of thought out there in terms of a philosophy when it comes to compensation. One is people who are very meritocracy oriented, meaning it's like, hey, I, I had to eat what I kill. I had to work hard. So I'm going to make you work hard too. So it's a lot of variable pay. Then there's other people who might say, well, I am more collegial and I want to incent people to operate in a real team orientation. And so we're going to have high base compensation and maybe small variable because we don't want to discourage somebody from working with someone else in the organization because they may not get paid for that. So what have you seen in terms of how firms think about compensation from a philosophy standpoint? You know, I think what is important um, to level set on is how does compensation fit into a broader strategy? And I think that a lot of firms focus immediately on jumping to either structure or jumping to the numbers without really thinking through what is their employee value proposition. And I think firms, and I'm sure many of the listeners on your show over the years, you've talked about, I'm sure, how do you develop your value proposition as you're thinking about what is unique about what your firm does to attract families, households, you know, investors, right? And, and, and that's what every advisor focuses on as they practice their craft. I think where advisors don't spend enough time though is, is on what is their employee value proposition. And when I think about an employee value proposition, you can think about salary, benefits, all of that, and really as being table stakes in our industry. It's, it's all things that if you only focus on that, you will likely have individuals and associates, advisors, staff, service staff, whoever in your organization, they'll be disengaged. They will leave for the next biggest, bigger paycheck, right? If that's all you focused on. And so one way we, we like to think about it is, is that what are you doing beyond that? So I'll give you some ideas of things that, you know, um, that should be above that. So things such as career development. How are you thinking about a person's individual personal development? How are you thinking about mentorship? How are you thinking about the autonomy that somebody might have at your um, firm? Are they, do they feel empowered to actually be able to make decisions? Um, and other recognition programs or incentive, additional incentive programs. Um, all of those things are important. And, and most importantly, if you really want to go from perhaps somebody that is only focused on the paycheck to person who is actually becoming an evangelist, what I like to think about is, is that do you have a person who has a sense of ownership? And do you find that individual actually has missional alignment? And what do I mean by missional alignment? They have a personal mission which actually aligns to your firm mission. And a great example of that, you know, um, if I think about our industry, I, I don't know if that is always the case. I think that when we, we've done research at Fidelity, we've found that advisors get into the business and they, when we ask them, why did you get into the business? What gets you excited about waking up every day to do what you do? It's, I wanna help people. And yet we don't talk about that enough. We don't talk about that is the, the core of what an advisor does. And that's a really, you know, very um, noble profession in many ways. And yet we don't emphasize that. And I, and I see that um, yet in other professions. I see that in teachers. I see that in social workers. I see that in nonprofits. And they have really strong personal and also firm or, or, or company or an entity, teachers especially, where a, there's that mission alignment. So I want to just make sure that before we dive into you know, how we think about conversation, we really have to level center. What is your employee value proposition? And how does that fit in beyond just compensation and benefits? It should include those other things I, I described, especially that mission alignment. That said, when I think about all those, um, the, the way you laid out the question around structure and as one element of philosophy, I think what it starts out with is understanding what's important to you as a firm from a values perspective. That's where it starts. And I'll just give you a few things to think about, which then I think um, can play into then perhaps structure. So for instance, are things such as a sense of ownership important to you from a philosophy perspective? Is long-term thinking from an associate important to you? Is um, perhaps fair and transparent pay 
important to you? Is, is meritocracy important to you? Is teamwork important to you? Is how an employee perhaps um, leads themselves and leads others in the organization? Those are all things that you can then, if you start there, you can then structure the right compensation. Yeah. So in other words, it's not easy. <laughs> so, no. th th you know, this is something that firms really have to be thoughtful about. And in your experience, have you found firms have really dialed in on these things that you're talking about here at the very beginning? Or are these things that evolve over time? Do they tend to change as a company goes from maybe a hundred million dollar company to a $1 billion company or a $10 billion company? Have you seen that at different sizes of organizations, the way they think about what you just described there might evolve over time? What have you seen in that area? Yeah, I think there's a couple of factors. I think size plays into it. I think also um, the tenure of the associates and the tenure of the organization. Many, many individuals in our industry have started out in classically a payout model. I mean, if you think about the number of advisors that enter into our profession, the number one place that they're likely going to start in the profession is likely gonna be in a model today that is in a payout model. And that's just the reality of where they start. They, they may have started at a, at a warehouse, a bank, and most of those models are likely insurance providers. They're mostly pay up model driven, right? That's, that's a known fact in our industry. That said, what ends up happening if they work in the RIA space especially is, is that what you find is, is that they start there. So they may have perhaps left a warehouse, they may have gone to an independent space and they may start out with a pay up model and they realize over time that there's issues structurally with this. There could be inequities between advisors where one advisor is ben um, and who is an owner advisor is benefiting at you know because somebody else is growing the firm, especially if they're an owner. But right? it causes then and, and then another piece of tension is well we're starting to think about succession planning and how do we think about the next generation of ownership? And they realize, gosh, we had three or four founders who are all on the same um, page, all working as team, and then we have another advisor that we've been growing and bringing alongside that is very much about themselves. And that's when things break down is when you have these conversations with, with these firm principals and they realize that they have issues that are not sustainable for the long term. And so they start to want to um, evolve, I'd say from perhaps where they were and they start to say, you know what, there must be a different way to do this. We need to think about ownership in the future. We need to be thinking about how can we get people to um, be all aligned. Now, I will say though, see if there's, you know, roughly 15,000 RIAs, let's say, depending on how you count it. Um, and there's probably 10,000 different ways that um, REAs end up um, creating compensation structures. There's not one way. I, I will have to say that I think there's some um, guardrails. I think you know many start out in the um, you know predominantly payout model, and then there's a spectrum to go all the way over to the salary and bonus structure based on those criteria. And then I think there's flavors in between that and squeaks you can add along the way. So as an example, if you believe that um, it's really important to have long-term thinking and a sense of ownership phantom share programs enter into the mix, right? Or perhaps even deferred comp programs um, enter into the mix. I think the other piece is, is that on that scale, um, things you know in the salary bonus structure um, area, as you want to create individual meritocracy, there are ways to you know, evolve that bonus structure to make sure you're doing that as well. But, so it's not an all or nothing. I think people assume that with a salary bonus structure, there's no way to drive individual meritocracy. And I think that um, a fallacy that's not quite true. You mentioned this idea of sense of ownership, and I've had a lot of conversations with advisors where they'll talk about that and they'll say, we're trying to create a sense of ownership among the team members, but they don't have a phantom stock plan or something similar like that. I had a conversation with a couple of different people in different industries who actually um, run organizations that have ESOPs. And they made it very clear that once they moved to the ESOP structure, the employee stock ownership plan structure, they really were owners and they could see a marked difference in how the employees operated now that they were actual true owners of the organization. So what have you seen firms do in terms of trying to create that sense of ownership, even if it, they don't have a phantom stock plan or they're not actual shareholders or it's not an ESOP, are there other things that you can do in terms of creating the culture that makes people think and act 
as if they actually were owners of the organization. You know, Steve, I wanna, I'm gonna link this to something else that is, um, I know a hot topic out there right now, which is diversity and inclusion. And, and it's very similar to inclusion uh, in my mind. And what I mean by that is, is that it gets at this aspect of culture that is some, somehow sometimes hard to put your, um, really your, your finger on. It's really hard to measure objectively, but then you know when you see it, right? And so I'll give you some examples of behaviors perhaps that I think would be uh, one way to think about it. So if I think about it and, and through the lens of diversity inclusion, I think about it from an inclusion lens specifically because diversity is how you may look at the organization, how diverse is it, right? I think we all probably both um, understand and appreciate that. But inclusion is how, how would you feel, actually feel a sense of, um, do they actually feel included in meetings? Do they feel included in the day-to-day -day activities that are happening at the firm? Um, do they have a sense of a belonging? That's another word that often people have. So from an ownership perspective and from an inclusion perspective, there's behaviors you can actually measure. So is it, in the diversity and inclusion space, one behavior you might be able to measure is, you know, can you ask the question about how often do you include junior level associates into meetings with your, with your clients? That would be a sense of inclusion. Are you including individuals that don't normally would have a seat at the table in big decision-making meetings, for instance? Right? That would be a sense of inclusion into your organization. Ownership. Very similar parallel in my mind. And if I think about it, I think about ownership is, is that, are you giving them things where they actually are held accountable and personally accountable for things? And then there's correspondingly perhaps ways you can hold them you know, and reward them for that sense of accountability. I think that a sense of ownership comes with more than anything else, a, a aspect of autonomy, a sense of entrepreneurial spirit. All of those things are the things that I think about. And so. Do you give them the latitude to be able to actually make um, decisions and actually drive change in the organization? That's what I think about when I think about ownership. And many firms, unfortunately, you know, perhaps don't. And do they create a culture of, that stifles an entrepreneurially spirited individual, as an example? Yeah, and I think what I hear you saying is you can say to someone, hey, here's what we need to have done, but you figure out how to get it done. So it's that sense of empowerment. It's like, I'm not gonna look over your shoulder. I'm not gonna micromanage you. This is what we need to get done. You know what the goals are. You know what the objectives are. Now I trust you that you're, you're competent and you're gonna come up with a way to figure this out. If you need my help, I'm here, the door is open. Um, so I think that, you know, it, 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 would that be fair to say what you were, yeah, part of that, what you're that's describing? Spot, that's spot on, Steve. I, you know, I think that not enough um, individuals actually foster that type of environment. Um, right? Or they don't even ask the question of the associate, they just do it themselves. I mean, one of the things that I think is um, challenging for advisors that are also sometimes partners is not delegating enough. One of the concepts that I often will talk about with um, advisors is, are you truly working at the top of your license? Right? Um, I mean, medical profession has figured it out there. I mean, they're constantly pushing stuff down to work at the top of the license. And I don't believe advisors are doing the same. I think we have a huge opportunity as an industry to have um, advisors actually doing the work they should be doing in front of clients and or running the firm, but then delegating more to junior level advisors and giving them the skills to develop their craft, but then also develop leadership skills along the way as well. Well, it's funny you should say that because my, my wife kids me. She said, Steve, every job you've ever had, you've always made yourself irrelevant. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she says, well, you, you hire people, you put stuff in place so they don't need you anymore. <laughs> and so, um, and I actually pride myself on that. I mean, to me, that's kind of like, you know, you're doing what you need to do. You're getting the right people in place. You're putting the systems in place. And then that enables me to operate at, you know, the highest level of my license, so to speak, as you're describing there. So I think that's, that's a great way to describe it, how you just, uh, uh, described it there. You know, something else that you, you mentioned here just a minute ago that I want to go back to is this idea of mission alignment. And so often I hear people say, well, we all kind of do the same thing. I mean, we're in the business of helping people with their financial situation. What have you seen in terms of this idea of mission alignment? Some of the firms that you've worked with, what when they say we're on a mission to blank, what are some examples of missions that firms have that you've been working with? Yeah, uh, great, great question. I think that a lot of the best ones I've had the pleasure of working with focus around 
more than anything else, um, peace of mind is I think a common thing that I find among a lot of them is what are they doing to help help their clients really achieve peace of mind? And that's, um, that's very parallel with our concept of this idea of this advice value stack, um, which we've put forth, which is this idea that you know, money management is at the base of the pyramid, then you've got financial planning, and then um, you know, more than anything else, and that financial planning is so critical, I think, you know, and we believe that that's table stakes as well, achieving uh, and, and really achieving goals. The next, the next level above that is really about peace of mind and fulfillment. And, and in order to get to peace of mind and fulfillment, as we think about this, think of you know, almost like a Maslow's hierarchy of need, the firms that are doing this really well are getting to that peace of mind and fulfillment. And the, mission, the reason why I believe that there's a mission alignment is, is because they can see how they're actually changing. Um, and see that you talked about this return on life, right? That idea of actually getting beyond just the finances, of actually helping people tangibly with, with life's complexities. You know, I think about, um, so my wife's, um, uh, grandmother just passed away uh, two weeks ago. She was 99 years old. And God, this this woman, um, amazing woman, World War II veteran. She um, passed away on a Thursday. On Wednesday, she dialed 911 herself from her uh, from her one bedroom apartment. I, that we all would would live the richness of the life that she lived um, would be wonderful. And I and I think about all the stuff that has unfolded over the last two weeks. And from my um, my wife's mother and her brother, the two of them as the Mexican trying to deal with everything, the apartment, the complexities of, of figuring out all the banking and everything else, all the stuff that's, that, they, that she left. And she did a really good job of preparing. She was very comfortable with where she was and ready for, for, for her death. She died well, as some might say. And yet there was still so much um, aspects of being overwhelmed. Well. Having lived through that, and I know many of the listeners may have done that and helped clients, that is what I, I, I hear, is providing that peace of mind through those types of life moments is what I think is transformative. And so the, the clients that I've worked with that have actually done that well have, have found that to be the, the source is how do they simplify life's complexities when life throws your curveball, like when somebody um, passes away in your family or there's a divorce or the birth of a child or you decide to sell your business. All of those life moments that happen are, are ways that where the advisor is providing peace of mind and, and ultimately providing fulfillment, which really is about legacy a lot of times as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of the advisors can get that satisfaction because they're working with the client deeply and having those meaningful conversations about that. How do you then take that to the rest of the organization, the rest of the people on the team? How do you, as a leader, get them to feel that same sense of mission and get them to feel like I'm helping them open the account, but they may not necessarily be sitting in the room when the advisor is having that conversation about the spouse that just passed away and how you're helping them deal and process with that situation. So as the leader, how do you create that feeling and that understanding of the mission so that me, if I'm at the lowest level of the organization, I can still feel it as intensely as the advisor, as the owner of the organization? I think you have to um, raise the transparency and awareness of it, I think I think it's sharing. So uh, some of the best firms actually spend you know once a month, literally sharing stories of how they've solved clients' problems. And I think it's in that sharing of 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 actually understanding how did we solve the clients' problem, but also how did we get to it. I'll just give you another example. You know, um, an investor calls into an advisor's office, and the investor um, calls in and is asking one of the individuals who is the service operations person for a wire transfer. And this, um, this doctor client is asking for a wire transfer of $50,000. And the, um, the service individual um, just asked, you know, I'm just curious, what's the wire transfer for? And the, the doctor client decided, you know, shares, uh, my computers on my office were just held ransom. And in that moment, um, the, the service operations per person realized, you know, I should probably likely ask a few more questions and likely bring on the advisor on the phone as well in that moment. And in, the, and, and in that process, what the advisor was able to do in that moment was being able to help them not just with the wire transfer, right? Transactional in nature, what you just alluded to, right? That's their job. They got to get the wire transfer done immediately. But more importantly, help mitigate potentially another situation down the road by introducing them to a cyber fraud specialist. 
who can help them navigate and make sure I get, will I make sure I get my, all my data back? How do I make sure I put the right controls in place so that it does not happen again? All of those things. Now, what could have happened if, if you think about the, the path that it went down, it could have went down the first path, which is I'll just handle the wire transfer and nothing else, transactional. In that situation, that, that individual, that service operations personal is clearly not thinking beyond, they're not thinking about how to help this client more broadly and not even thinking about asking a, a, a deeper question, right? So, so I think a lot of this is oftentimes um, getting an organization to, to think about how am I being just humbly curious about what, what's going on with my clients. And then I think, and in, in that's a cultural aspect, right? That's a, that's a cultural change perhaps for some firms where all they're thinking about is transaction. But I think it can, it can be achieved if you are sharing stories around what's important to us and here's how we've helped clients and here's how everyone across the organization has a, a responsibility to do that. It's not just me, to, the advisor to ask tough questions, it's you, the service person that's getting in a transactional thing to ask it. Uh, just, you know, inquisitive question, just be curious about their life and what's going on in their life. I do want to talk about uh, at a granular level in terms of some of the compensation structures and um, how people are making uh, variations between base comp versus uh, variable comp and that. But before we get to that, I do want to talk about career paths. And so I know some firms have more formalized career paths in place, others don't. But tell me a little bit about how you think about career paths. Is it is there, um, do you have to be a certain size of an organization before you really need to be thinking about career paths for your team? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, you know, what I think about when I think about career paths is I think a bit of it as a jungle gym a little bit. And what I mean by that is I think people assume that it's just a ladder going up. And I think of it as you sometimes have to go across, up, down in your career. And, and the reason for that, I believe, is, is that, you know, most people don't, you know, when they're in high school, don't decide I want to become a financial advisor when I go to college. Most don't. And I have a lot of um, a, a lot of respect and a lot of support for this the College for Financial Planning's uh, um, degree programs. I think they're really important. The CFP programs, degree programs are really important to our industry. Yet they only fill some part of it. And I think that the reality of it is, is that many in our industry are career changers. And it's expected that on average, individuals will have likely somewhere around seven, you know, barrel labor statistics, depending on which um, data you see. So it's about seven careers over a person's lifetime and roughly 15 job changes. That can be lots of different ways you can calculate that. But if, the, if that's true, and I, I'm evidence of that, I've had six different careers. This has been my longest for the last 10 years. And if that's true, then the reality of it is, is that you don't know you want to become a financial advisor, even when you first start with a firm. And you may have a diff, you may have a lot of twists and turns along the way. So the first acknowledgement is, is that it is a jungle gem. And even just getting to the, perhaps the first rung of the jungle gem, the first step on the jungle gem might even be a little bit of a, of a, of a sideways path. That's the first part. The second part I, I think is, is that um, there are individuals within an organization that are going to need more structure and rigidity. And then there's gonna be some that are gonna be fine with ambiguity. And I think the most important thing that's important across both of those is being transparent and incredibly um, uh, 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 educating individuals about those options and being proactive with regards to how you're uh, managing them. You know, one of the things that I find that some of the best firms do is they actually have either quarterly or semi-annual check-ins with their associates about their development plan. And so my one best practice that I would say is, is that do you actually spend the time to understand what are individuals' aspirations, dreams, hopes? You spend your time doing that with your clients. Are you doing the same with your employees? And I don't think most spend the time like intentionally actually saying, let's carve out an hour once a quarter or even once, twice a year, maybe even at a minimum once a year, one hour to sit down and just talk about what you want. And in doing that, actually develop, all right, so here's what you've done. Here's what you'd like to do. Let's develop a plan. Here's the areas that are your strengths. Here's the areas that are your opportunity areas. And here's how we need to develop those areas, those strengths and complement those strengths and, and you know, perhaps make sure we're leveraging them as, from a firm perspective in the, in the types of places you wanna go. 
Firms don't spend the time actually doing that, actually develop and form a development plan. Career pathing is, is great. You can put it on a, on a piece of paper. We're going to go from a service professional to a perhaps a um, junior advisor to an, to an advisor to a senior advisor to partner. You can put that on paper. But without an actual thoughtful career development plan, which actually recognizes how is that person evolving, then I don't think it actually helps anybody if you just put that um, that uh, you know that out there. It's great to have some structure, but at the same time, people want to know what is it going to take to get there. And I think that's what a career development plan actually helps um, individuals see and do. And are you seeing any differences among generations or across generations? For example, the baby boom generation, and I'm going to stereotype here, but they would put in long hours. FaceTime and you know they would know, oh, it's not, it's gonna be two years before you get your first promotion and so on and so forth. Now let's fast forward to maybe Gen Z or the millennials, where there's a stereotype out there, I think, that they want to move up faster. They they move jobs quicker. So is there anything that we should be keeping in mind as we're thinking about the generational differences? And we've got four generations in the workplace these days, which complicates things as well. So any thoughts that you have in terms of generational differences that we should think about in terms of either career paths or compensation or any of these other issues related here? Well, first off, um, this year, Gen Y turns 40. So people are, are first off, I think people say the millennials are, are young. But yes, they're young, but they're also, they're, uh, they're, they're in the middle of their careers uh, for many of them. And so that's a, just, I wanna make sure that we st state that fact. The other piece is, is that I think there's a lot of misconceptions about, um, about the generational differences. And I don't think it's necessarily proven out yet. I think it's early. I think there's, there's nuanced differences. Yes, I hear from um, some that call the millennial generation, the umbrella parent, um, you know, the all sorts of things, parachute, sorry, parachute parent um, generation among others. And therefore, as a result, um, these things must be true. I, I think that it really depends on an individual basis. And, and even just as, just as an example, if you think of the baby boomers, right? Let's take them back to the 1960s. How were they behaving and how were they acting in the 1960s? Where were the they hippies. at that? Where were they, yeah, where, where were they at that life stage? Are we seeing the same among a incredibly engaged, um, motivated population on certain topics, social causes especially? You better believe it, on, on especially on some of the younger Gen Y, Millennials and, and Gen Z, we are. And so, you know, I, I think about a lot of transformation that's happening because that generation is standing up and, and stepping into things, not going away from the work. But let me be clear, do they want mission alignment? You better believe it. Do you think baby boomers did back in the 60s? I bet they did as well. I wasn't, I wasn't there to understand it, but from everything I read, I think there was mission alignment as well back then for sure. And so I think that I think that there's actually a lot of parallels. I just don't think it's play, the story's played out yet. I think we just have to wait long enough for the story to play out. That's my personal. This is my personal belief. Um, and I think the data is going to be interesting to watch over time and to see how does this how do the generations move and change and adapt. Now we we do see from an investor perspective for sure differences in what they value from advice, um, which I'm sure we could talk about that for a while. But they definitely value the, the Gen X Y Z. Uh, generations value things differently. They, van they manage the management of money. They value less than they do, you know, things that are peace of mind and fulfillment for sure. Yeah. And the whole idea of the different generations, I mean, we could talk for hours about that, but I think it is important and relevant to the conversation here. And just like the point that you were making about how, if you look at the baby boomers and what were they doing when they were in their twenties? Well, you know, if, so if the baby boomer started in 1946 in their 20s is like the mid 60s, early 70s is kind of the peak of them. Well, what was happening back then? Well, we had the hippies. We had, you know, war protests. You know, so we had a lot of social stuff that was going on, just like we have a lot of social stuff going on here. So if you look at each generation, what were they doing at, at a particular age and compare that to the current generation, you know, at that age? What are the differences? What are the similarities? And I think the point you're making, and I agree, is that often we're going to see there's a lot of similarities for different generations at that stage. Now, with that said, 
there's also differences because if you look at what's happening today with technology and social media and the impact that that's had on society relative to when the baby boomers in the 60s were in their 20s and when they were growing up in the 50s and didn't have social media, you know, it, it's a whole different ball game. So it's, it's not right. definitely, it's not an apples to apples comparison. So we have to keep that stuff in mind too. So, you know, I find that stuff, you know, very, very fascinating. And it makes a leader's job more complicated because you have to understand these variables. And um, I mean, I think I'm kind of in an interesting position because I'm a young baby boomer and I've got three kids, uh, two of whom are definitely millennials. And the third one who might technically be a millennial, but probably identifies closer to a Gen Z. So it's been interesting to see their perspective and things that I've been able to introduce to them, you know, even as the old guy here, so to speak. So it's been a lot of fun to, to be able to see how, how that's moved through by having the kids and, and how they're working in the workplace these days and how they think about social issues. So anyway, we're kind of getting a little bit off uh, the, the topic here of, of compensation and staffing, but I think that's an important piece to keep in mind is that it's, it's uh, and, and you know, and actually this leads to another issue since we're kind of talking about this idea of social things. Um, I've just seen here in the last uh, few months, a couple companies that I think a lot of people would recognize. One of them is Coinbase. Uh, they did their public uh, listing here not long ago. Uh, but Brian Armstrong, the co-founder of the company, I think it was last year, he, he came out and basically said, hey, there's no politics here at the office, you know, we're, we're shutting down the Slack channels or whatever, you know, to keep your politics at home. And then I just saw here recently that another company out of Chicago uh, called Basecamp, uh, they basically came out with the same thing and said, you're not gonna talk about politics here. Uh, we're no longer a paternalistic organization. We're no longer gonna support and, and subsidize you having a gym membership and, and uh, you know, serving organic food or whatever. He said, you know, we're just not gonna make those statements anymore. So um, in, in that area, what are you seeing firms do? Are they starting to, um, to be more accepting of bringing social things into the office or making social statements as a company? We've seen a lot of Fortune 500 companies that have been very active in taking strong stands on particular issues. Is that something you're starting to see in the advisory community? Yeah, I have. And um, let me connect it to, so I think for sure, as it relates to especially diversity and inclusion, I think over the last year, we've seen several of our clients that have been forthright with regards to, um, you know, statements on their website, publicly coming out and um, being very clear about what their values are. This is the values, I think, you know, at the heart of it is, is that they want to, I think many of them want to stand what they believe is on the right side of history around their values. And so when they say they have a safe and respectful workplace, then this, that means X, Y, and Z. And as part of that, one of those safe and respectful workplaces aspects is, a, you know, an aspect of inclusion in the workplace. And so, yes, and, and, and let's be clear. Some of those clients of ours that have done this um, have had tough conversations with their clients um, and have lost some clients as a result um, because they've been so proactive in doing that. Yet I will tell you that the employees there are super engaged and very much so on the topic. And they're driving it from the bottom up and as much as it is coming from the top down. Um, so yes, I will say, and, and a lot of it is very um, fascinating to watch is that as I've had the um, pleasure of, of running some diversity inclusion roundtables with some of our clients, is that a lot of it is, you know, the, the individuals that are ch the, the change makers are individuals that are younger generations, that are not the owners. They're the ones that are driving the change and the owners recognize the need for it though, is, is, is what has been wonderful to see. Yeah, and I think the reality is that as human beings, it's not like we can be one person at home and have this belief system and how we present ourselves to the people outside of the office and then go into the office and try and turn that off and say, well, I've got to be something different in the office or I can't bring this aspect of me into the workplace because my boss says, you know, we're here to work. We're not here to do this other stuff. So um, 
you know, we're, we're kind of in that period right now where I think there's just, you know, a lot of stirring up of that going on and people are trying to figure it out. And some companies like, again, Coinbase and Basecamp have said, hey, you leave that at home. And then, but I think many more companies are saying, no, you can't separate it. This is who we are. We're taking a stand. And like you say, these are our values. And I think that is so spot on. And I, I say this to advisors all the time, the importance of really clarifying what your values are, because once you're clear on what your values are, it makes decision-making so much easier. So when you do run into these issues, uh, whether they're social issues, whether they're business issues, if you're clear on who you are and what you stand for, then it's going to be clear what you do and the decisions that you make and how you're going to function as a company. And you also touched on this idea of the mission alignment, that when you're clear on who you are and those values, the mission becomes clear. And that attracts the people to you that are aligned with that mission. And it repels the people who aren't because you're not gonna be the right fit for everybody. Uh, you know, because right. if, 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 if everyone's like, oh yeah, this is great, then, then you probably don't stand for anything because you're not, you're not gonna, you know, because we all have different belief systems. But um, anyway, yeah, yeah so and, I think- and to, that, and to that point, Steve, sorry to interrupt, as I'll be clear, that one firm who um, stood up and, and had a, client that didn't like their message were, were fine with it. And that is standing by your convictions. I, I recognize that's hard sometimes, but I think it's important um, to your employees. And, and the last thing I'll just say on that, on the, on the importance of this, of being true to it is this idea of code switching is what you're referring to is when people go and they try to be one person at home or one person with their buddies and one person in the office, that's three different people. And it's so hard to do. That can be exhausting. It's a term called code switching and, and being, bringing your true authentic self is so much more easy and actually more authentic. And that's what I think most employers want is they want an employee to be their true authentic self and, and bring their whole self to work so that they actually are willing to, um, to do that and serve their clients as a result in an authentic way. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, let's uh, let's switch gears here just a bit and talk about some details in terms of compensation structure. So let's start with, with an advisor. So let's say I'm the owner of the company and I've got two or three or 10 or 20 advisors on my team. What are you seeing in terms of how firms think about the compensation structure. And I, again, I know you, you, know, you mentioned 15,000 RIAs and there's probably 10,000 different ways to do it, but let's just kind of talk in some uh, examples of what you've seen out there in terms of how do we compensate a financial advisor? Yeah, so I started by saying that there's a spectrum of, let's say one end of the spectrum is an advisor gets compensated on payout model, right? So that's classically, and, and let's be clear, the majority of our industry is there. Is, is getting paid on a payout model. The other, other end of the spectrum is usually a salary and bonus structure. Um, and usually those are in firms that run typically more likely in an ensemble fashion um, is what I'd say. And what I mean by that is, is that it's, you know, in one sense, it's an individual performance based. Um, eat what you kill as you, as you used the word, Steve. I think that's absolutely true. And the other one, it's more about the team and serving a client in a team structure and very much, it could be even specialist structure, as some has said, especially um, lately, is serving them in a very um, complementary way around a team with a very specialist structure. It could be another way of thinking about it. And along that um, spectrum, um, you have ways, so let me just talk about some of the bonus elements that you can use to then drive meritocracy, right? So if you have a salary and bonus structure, you can put in bonus structures in place and bonus pools that are governed by different factors at the firm. So you could have, for instance, firm level performance drives a part of the bonus pool, right? That could drive the overall component of the bonus pool. How does the firm do? We then allocate the um, bonus pool at a certain funding level based on how the firm's doing. So it grows as the firm, firm grows. As a, as a function of individual performance, you can then divvy up that bonus pool based on how did this individual contribute to the individual's goals. And this is a key element of this is creating goals for the firm, creating goals for the individuals, creating goals for the team, is that's how you get to objective criteria. So did this person suppose you say, you know what, this year we expect this individual to bring on three new clients roughly, or four new clients, let's say. And are, did that individual actually bring in that many clients? Even better yet, um, you know, what I've seen some firms evolve to is, uh, you know, historically it's been 
and often often is net new assets. Many firms are evolving to something um, such as net new revenue. So that way we get to pricing because we want to make sure that we're not just bringing in assets, we want to make sure it's quality assets. And even better yet is if you look at profitability of the firm, like how profitable is the firm, right? I think that's the hallmark is, is if you could get to profitability. So those are all ways of thinking about um, the bonus. And then along that spectrum, if you value, you know, back to the compensation philosophy, you value long-term thinking, then as you, we were talking earlier, the deferred comp, ESOPs, phantom shares, and ultimately ownership as, as a clearly, a, if you look on the spectrum, you know, more sense of ownership, more sense of teamwork, all of those things can be um, brought in. Deferred comp can clearly be, I'd say more often the case if you have um, a, just a pure payout model, I see that more often in that model than I do perhaps some of those phantom share, um, you know, stock appreciation rights, those types of programs as well as ESOP programs. So I've also seen firms that have two types of advisors. So one is what I'll call a servicing advisor. So we've got, and typically this might be a larger firm where they've got a marketing machine. And so they've got a marketing department that generates a tremendous amount of, of leads and they pretty much bring them on. And then they essentially turn them over to the advisor and say, hey, you go the final uh, you know, mile here to get them to become a client. And then you just service them. We don't need you to go out and try and drum up new business, just take care of these clients, get some referrals and that's great. So let's say that's one. And then a second could be someone who is more like on the payout, on a grid where you, you eat what you kill to kind of use an old term. And I mean, are you, are you seeing that as well? Where some people are just like a servicing advisor. We've got plenty of clients. I just need people to service them. Is that, is that one distinction yeah, that, you're seeing out there? Yes, Steve. And I'd say that's an evolution that often happens over time. And in fact, it creates a um, so a couple of things that end up happening is, is those servicing advisors, like, oh, I want to be in that driver's seat. I want to get compensated that way. So it can create, um, you know, sometimes challenges internally. Um, and, and I hate to say, it, but some of those people are just feel entitled um, and, and can create a sense of entitlement. Oh, I, I want what that other person has. So that's one watch out for firms when they're dealing with that. The other thing I'll just, uh, I'll share with you is, is that when you have, um, um, salary structures that are different across the organization that can that can in general just raise lots of questions um, when you don't have fair and transparent approaches. And so I think that that is a big part of this is, is that how do you make sure that people all feel that they're all rolling the same way and we're all being compensated. One firm did this, um, did a really interesting idea, which is they, they took um, their um, associates and in essence said, you know what, we're going to split um, the compensation for a client for 50% of it is going to go um, from a payout perspective to the associate that brought in um, the, um, the individual family and 50% is going to go to the servicing advisor and they cap each advisor at a certain amount of clients. So let's say they cap any advisor, say at hyper 80, 80 clients. And so if you happen to perhaps drive referral growth or you happen to bring on a new client, you're not allowed to take it if you're at your capacity, but you will still get an annuity until you retire, actually even beyond retirement. They've actually built it out such that you, it's a retirement plan in essence for that, um, for that firm. So it's a very creative way and all associates. So even the service, and so that's an interesting creative solution around what you just described, but it's transparent across the entire firm. If you are hypothetically in the service and operational part, part of the business, and you're, you're not compensated away. If you bring in a referral, you're compensated just like a, uh, an advisor would be if you were to bring in a referral and you get that same annuity stream. So th you know, that's another thing that's really important as we think about our profession is, is that how are we creating um, you know, fairness, transparency, and meritocracy across the entire organization, not just for advisors, but other service and operations for growth in the business. And that's one way that firms have done that. So you've mentioned the word transparency a few times here. Have you seen firms go so far as to publicly make people's compensation available? No. I mean, that would kind of be the ultimate. So you're not seeing any of that. No, structure for sure, structure for sure. And I think that um, the other piece is, is that understanding the structure based off of the type of position, that for sure, but not like, you know, not, you know, Steve, what you make versus what I make, no, not that level of um, transparency. I think people can ascertain this is the range that somebody likely makes, but at the same time, it's more structure. Okay. So let's talk about 
uh, staff members, so non-advisors in the organization, what are you seeing as some of the more common ways that they're compensated these days? Yeah, for sure. Non-advisor roles, let's assume that they're not an owner, then I think most, 100% of the time that I've seen it, uh, it's been salary and bonus, as, as simple as that. And then um, layered in on top of that is likely um, phantom share programs and other programs that, depending on the role, um, so, for instance, a director of operations, an individual that is a sort of key person in the organization, managerial-wise or leadership-wise, as you know, organizations get bigger, as you can imagine, there's uh, um, other additional programs on top of that. But for the most part, I'd say that's fair to say salary and bonus. And, and I think the bonus, it's fair to say also that bonus, the percentage of bonus eligibility um, starts low, um, you know, so a higher percentage of, of sort of fixed salary versus variable comp as you start in the organization and that variable comp grows as a percentage of your total comp over time, as you stay with the organization, as you grow and as you, um, you know, take on more elevated roles. So I think that's, those are what we see in general is that, you know, it might start at say 5% of eligibility and you might go up to 20% over time as an example. So a couple of things there. So one is the mix between base versus variable comp. So here you just said, maybe you start at 5%, maybe it goes up to 20%. So I've seen where, and, and it makes sense, I mean, the higher up in the organization you are, if you go from a, you know, service associate to a, you know, service manager to a marketing manager to maybe a, a VP of operations, then your base goes up, but then the percentage of your comp that comes from variable increases as well. So you have more risk. Are you seeing that as well? And what might be some some specific numbers that you might see, and are there any turning points where if someone is like at a hundred thousand of base, uh, typically they might have a twenty percent bonus opportunity. Is it typically based on the title that they have, or would it be more based on their their base compensation level would determine what percent would then become variable? Yeah, I think it's so we we do have data on this, and it, predominantly it focuses on title is drives then what, and it's really based off of what we you find in the market, right? The competitive marketplace. And so what, when you think about it is, is you're trying to get to a total compensation package that is gonna be fair and competitive relative to how might it look across the marketplace. That's, that's usually the barometer. And so when you get to that total number and then you adjust for geography, which has some impact as you can imagine, then it, it comes out to, all right, so if I need to um, hire a director of operations and I, my target comp needs to be around 130 and I want to start out with a base comp of 100, then it makes sense that my bonus is, you know, ends up being netting around target bonus, let's be clear, is around $30,000. And so, yes, I think that it, you, you'll find that it's more a function of the title and role of the person um, versus even something as um, generic as tenure. Is what I is what I would say. Is title is the determinant, and the reason why is because again, competitive market um, would drive that. Okay, so I know Fidelity. You guys have some some reports on that. So is that stuff that's publicly available to people listening to this that they can get access to some of your studies that you've done on that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you can, you can um, go to our website at i.fidelity.com. We do have some thought leadership and content on our website. You can also reach out to your Fidelity associate. And we'd be happy to follow up with you and see how we can help you with um, our compensation data, as well as um, you know helping with you thinking about any of the talent topics we talked about or client experience, even topics we talked about today. Okay, so let's let's continue with this example that you just gave. So you've got a, a position. What, what was it? What level did you call it that you said was director 130, of operations? Yeah, director sorry, of operations. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So let's say we've got a director of operations. We've got a targeted total comp cash comp of one hundred and thirty thousand. 100,000 is base salary, 30,000 is bonus. Now, here's the tricky part. What do we base that 30,000 of bonus on? So some of it's gonna be part individual performance, some of it's probably gonna be part company performance. What are you seeing is typically the mix between that? Um, what are some of the actual variables within say company? And I mean, you've touched a little bit on this, but, but just kind of concrete, what are, uh, the mix between individual versus company performance, and then some of the specifics that those are measured against. Yeah, unfortunately, don't have great data around what that breakdown is percentage-wise, but let me talk in generalities around what we see with regards to um, the types of things that are the that are components of those contributions. Hmm. So um, firm performance, 
Um, the team performance is another component. So sometimes there could be individuals that are on a team. So if this is a team of say all the ops professionals, right? There could be a team allocation based on how did the operations team do as a, as a totality versus other teams and, and the entity. There can be a individual component as you described. There could also be components within the individual one around what are their actual goals. And so for instance, if you had a goal of as a director of operations, quality goals, right? That could be an indication like how often do we have, you know, things that were processed on time. There could be an aspect of perhaps, um, you know, how many, um, how, uh, how quickly you process things that, that year, there could be sort of quality as well as speed or efficiency. There could be project based reward and recognition programs as well. Like, so did we deliver the following CRM implementation? Because clearly director of operations would have that kind of um, influence. Do we onboard a new um, vendor? All those things. So all those things can be project based that could go into their goals. At the, at the heart of it is, when I think about what um, bonus is driven by is getting to both objective and subjective goals, especially for staff level roles is do you have the ability to get to both objective and subjective goals and document them and then hold people accountable over the course of the year? How did we do this quarter on your goals? And, you know, because, because if you don't have that, then there's, there's no point at the end of the year, um, you know, when you're having a career planning conversation and then, and you're reflecting on the, on the year, how you did, how are they going to feel if you, that was the first time you talked to them and you're sharing them their compensation for their bonus. So one of the things that we encourage is, is that throughout the course of the year is to reflect on how the goals are. And the other thing I'll just mention is to always separate career development discussions from compensation discussions. The two should be separate. Oftentimes, and I can still remember um, in my past, you know, where the two were linked. And what ends up happening is, is that you always forget about the career development piece and you just look at the number. And if you did well, then that's less important both to the manager and to the associate. And so by separating them, even by three or four weeks, having career, career development conversations separately, here's how you did against your goals, here's how um, your performance was, and here's where you're going, or here's where you'd like to go, versus here's where your compensation, your number is, is really critical and vital. And then you can use that as a, as a barometer for, all right, we'll reflect back on that goals conversation we had and how you did. Another area that I find can be very tricky is when we're setting the, the, the variable comp piece and what those components are, what the, the goals are that are gonna generate that particular bonus is, how do we determine what is expected of the job itself? Like this is what you're supposed to be doing for the 100,000 that I'm paying you versus I'm gonna pay you up to 30,000. Maybe I can even pay you more than 30,000 because maybe the 30,000 is the target, but if, if you go way above and beyond, maybe you make 40 or 50,000 more. How should we be thinking about what is bonusable because it's above and beyond what I expect you to do in the job versus uh, that's just part of your job. I, I see a lot of people struggle with making that distinction because sometimes it's like, well, if the target comp is 130, then I'm just gonna make you work a little harder for that extra 30, but I was gonna pay you 130 anyway. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thankful that you asked that question to you because I think that's right. Is almost, you almost have to say that if they hit, you know, one, one way that I've seen firms do it is, is to say, all right, so if you achieve all of your goals, then that's hitting 130. That's what it is. And if, if, you, are, if you don't achieve your goals, then it's gonna be less than that. So let's take an advisor role because this is going to be an easy one for us all to visually, I think, be able to understand. So if you're if it, if you had an advisor that at the end of the year you expect them to bring on four new clients, that's that's the goal, and that translates into say roughly fifty thousand dollars worth of net revenue to the firm. Okay, so you expect that as a result of that, that this individual is going to be eligible for say uh, an extra say twenty five thousand dollars worth of bonus. That's going to be their bonus for this year. Okay, based off of that that goal. So by doing that, then what happens if that individual delivers, say, six new and they deliver 75? Well, then ideally they should be getting more than that, right? They should be getting not $25,000, maybe it's $30,000, maybe it's $35,000. If they hit less than that, if they hit, you know, perhaps they only got two clients in and they only bought in $25,000, they should probably only get $12,000 perhaps and in, in, um, in their bonus. So I think there has to be um, both a carrot and a stick. and. A, you know, and some firms have been even um, more thoughtful as well to even add accelerants. So if for instance, let's say that you, your goal was four and you say, you know what, you brought in six, that's great. 
we'll, we'll give you extra. But if you bring in 10, we're going to accelerate even more. And, and that's where, um, you know, and, and this is where I think clients, um, you know, uh, that we've you know, had the pleasure of doing this work with, Steve, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, it gets exciting because they really think about what can they do to really reward um, the individual performance, but then also link it to team performance. What did the team do to help contribute um, to what that individual did as well? And that's a big aspect of an opportunity I think our industry has is, is, is how can we reshape and not just being about that one advisor, but then also what did the team do to support the new account opening? All the conversations that happen because an advisor may have used a pair planner. How did that pair planner help as um, part of closing the business? There was oftentimes our business is a team business and we don't necessarily um, always recognize that when it comes to compensation. So I want to just double click on what you said here, because I think this is so important that if you're going to dock somebody's bonus or not give them a full bonus because they only brought in two clients as opposed to the four to get the full bonus, then you absolutely have to give them the upside on top of that. So that applies whether you're talking a financial advisor or whether you're talking a non-advisor team member that if the target is 130, then if they fall short and you're only going to pay them 120, well, if they go beyond the target, they better make 140. So they need to have this carrot and the stick as you described. So I just wanted to, to reiterate that point. Um, another question related to the bonus is a lot of advisors give discretionary bonuses around the end of the year, or maybe they do it mid-year and they do it around the, the end of the year. Do you have a, a thought on discretionary bonus? Is that is that a good thing, a bad thing? Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. How do you think about discretionary? Yeah, you know what I think about? I think about um, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And I think about, I think about uh, do, I, do I think I'm Clark Griswold and I'm expecting a, uh, a bonus that's going to end up being year after year what I'm hoping to save for my pool. That's what I'm thinking about. And I'm hoping it's not the jelly of the month club. And, and so I think that, um, you know, I think bonuses should be, should be driven by goals. And versus it being just um, arbitrarily um, given. I think there's there's ways to think about other discretionary things such as a profit sharing. I think that that is absolutely discretionary. Profit sharing is different though. And I think you can uh, structurally communicate that to associates. I think people might treat it the same way as Clark Griswold did in, in National Language Christmas Education, but at the same time, I think there's a way to position it differently. That said, I think bonuses, I think the, the right way that I personally believe that most firms have done it right when we've worked with them is by structuring it around goals. So you don't believe in the slot machine theory of discretionary bonus where you get this dopamine hit when you pull the next slot and oh my gosh, I hit the jackpot and, and it keeps them coming back again and again. Well, and again, this gets back to, you know, where I started the conversation too, Steve. I'm being a little facetious yeah, with that. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, at, at the end of the day, I mean, that's right. It's, it's um, and it also comes back to where I started the conversation. Like, how are you fitting this in into your employee value proposition, right? I mean, is this is this like the end all be all, or is it really the employee value proposition that you want to put your um, hat on? Is this really mission alignment? It's focused around mentoring and career development, so on and so forth. I think those are the things that I would I would encourage firms to be focused on versus just this aspect of you know, as you put it, you know, um, perhaps this little um, this big pot of gold that you're uh, that you're hoping that they feel um, rewarded for. Yeah, and I also find that if if you have a team member who is complaining about their pay, then you've got a much bigger problem because you know all, a lot of the studies will show that in well-run organizations, pay is not the number one thing that employees are concerned about. It's a lot of the other things, and pay only rises up to the top if they're unhappy with all the other non-compensation related issues. So again, people are complaining about pay, then you, you got bigger problems in the organization that you have to address. So um, along those lines, um, what are some of the most desired non-cash benefits? So here, for example, flexibility on working from home. Uh, you know, we're, you know, what we've seen here in 2020, here in 2021, everybody, pretty much everybody was working from home. I've seen some firms say, got to come back into the office. Other firms are, we're going to have a hybrid approach. What are you seeing maybe with that in particular? And then in general, what are some of the most desired non-cash benefits that you're seeing firms offer? 
So uh, let me talk with it relates as it relates to the current environment. And I think it's fair to say that it's wait and see for many firms, especially in urban centers. Um, many of our clients have run many roundtables over the last year with our clients. It's wait and see in many of the urban areas, um, especially in um, places where there's high rises and they're considering, you know, um, it's a wait and see based on variance and a lot of our factors. I think there's a lot of hope that by this fall, I think, you know, firms are hoping they can get their employees back in at some measured pace, but it, it's a wait and see a lot of places. And in some cases, it's, um, they've been in, you know, some uh, more non-urban places, rural places, they've been in the office the entire time, or, you know, they've figured it out because they have more space. There's a lot of reasons for why they may have been able to um, be in the office. Um, and it might be in shifts, like one week, one, you know, one percentage of the firm is there and one, one week, another percentage of the firm. Um, and, and in many cases, um, I think for sure the last year has accentuated the need for other benefits that weren't on the table. And, and so let me talk about what, you know, perhaps a couple of things that I think are a great place to start. So the first is, is as an employer is to take credit for what you are giving your um, associates. So many times, if you think about all these other benefits, um, many don't take credit for it by like what is, you know, what we would refer to as a total pay and benefit statement, which we have a sample for. If you want to reach out to us, we're happy to provide that. But a total pay and benefit statement really illustrates not just you know, compensation, which, you know, and including things like social security taxes, so on and so forth, but also thinking about things like 401k, you know, um, if you I assume you have a match of some sort, perhaps you know, vacation time, um, perhaps training that you're um, you know, allowing associates if they're pursuing their CFP or whatever, whatever have, have you. All of those things are sort of um, um, you know, table space. Maternity, paternity leave is another good one. All those things are things that you're paying for more than likely. And those are table stakes. Let me be clear about table stake fund and benefits. All the ones I just described are probably likely what I would say would be table stakes. That's 401k, training, paternity, maternity, vacation, all of that. When I, when I think about the um, current environment and what it sort of now has put on top of that, um, actually, before I go there, let me talk about some additional benefits that I think some firms, as they grow larger, will likely um, feel the pressure to offer. Insurance is probably top of mind. Um, you know, not all firms when they're small often will offer insurance, but I think that that is one that often, another one might be philanthropic match, um, you know, some charitable gift match of some sort. Another one might be um, paying for cell phones or technology. That's another one. Those are all sort of added um, ones that we often see. Um, in this environment, given the last uh, year, I think one of the things where we've seen where the biggest growth has been in is setting up the office at home. So paying for individuals to be able to manage that, of being able to offer flexible work um, schedules um, because you're having to deal with kids at home and don't have daycare options. I haven't um, actually adopt a different um, leave policies because of you know, having to have flexibility, you know, because you perhaps had a nanny and your nanny got sick and you have to deal with that in a minute's notice or your kids suddenly, they just shut down the school and they, you know, you're counted on them going to school. And, and now because of COVID, they, the kids are now um, fully virtual all of that happened. And I'd say the, um, the last thing, um, in addition to all the kid, um, you know, dealing with kids, and I have firsthand knowledge of that as a 13, uh, parent of 13 year old twins, um, I will say that the other end of the spectrum is just an important, which is dealing with aging parents. And many of our um, you know, clients have talked about the importance of that as, as have we as Fidelity Associates, I'll, I'll share that, you know, it, that's a whole big part that, it, you know, I think exploded this past year of awareness I'm making sure you you know you're providing um, access for employees to be able to take care of aging parents as well. Well, Anna, this has been great. As we wrap up here, is there anything else that you want to share that we haven't talked about yet? You know, I think that the one thing I'll just I'll just share that I encourage firms to really think about is is that you know th this topic of compensation is so important to so many firms, yet not often enough do you take a step back to actually look at how does this fit into a broader talent strategy. So if I can offer one piece of counsel to firms is really take that step back. Um, and we have you know, a great paper around this that talks about sort of an employee engagement model and how you think about different levels on the model. And where, where we believe is, is that compensation benefits are table stakes. You need to be able to offer competitive, fair, transparent, and meritocracy, all those things we talked about, but really get to that other aspect of missional alignment, you know, career development, all those things that we've talked about. So, and, and how does that fit into a broader talent strategy? So if I can encourage you on one thing is more broadly think about all those things we talked about, that diversity inclusion, 
um, your career development, all those other things broadly, compensation is one element to drive ultimately evangelists in your organization versus people that are gonna be just dis disengaged and only focus on compensation. But Steve, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to just talk about this topic that as you know, that we're passionate about and I know you're passionate about as well. Yeah, well, this has been fantastic. A great advice and guidance here. And again, why don't you give the address again if folks wanna either reach out to you or get some more information about Fidelity. Yep, absolutely i.fidelity.com is the website where you can find more information about leadership at Fidelity, but then also um, feel free to try to connect to your Fidelity um, representative and we'd be happy to help you with any of the topics we discussed today. Thanks for your great. time. Yeah, well, great. Well, we'll have some show notes here at stevesandusky.com as well. So I uh, appreciate you taking time here to be on the show. It was fantastic. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Steve, for the opportunity.